let's talk about the Barbie movie. Okay. Okay. So, um, what if I hadn't seen it? Like, we got all the way here, and I was like, anyway, good. Sorry. Oh yeah, like a certain writer at our paper that would just make up the movie reviews. Remember Whoa. that? Whoa. Yeah. It's pretty good. Anyway, um, I was really blown away from the marketing. What could this possibly be that everyone's acting all crazy? So I went to a theater with the re- with those reclining chairs, like those grandpa, like old. Mm, yeah. I went with two friends. It was like 9.45 at night at the 84th Street Theater here in Manhattan. And I fell asleep twice. I couldn't follow it. I was really like, it was really overwhelming. And at the end, we left with everyone in silence and didn't say anything because it. We I don't know if we were... It was like, it was trying to be so many things. I was like, it's postmodernism for the masses. They were like, has no one ever thought of these concepts before? And I was like, I feel like I just watched a giant TikTok reel. Also, maybe it was just too late for me and I was tired, but um, I had the Ken song stuck in my head. Yeah. And that dance number where they like are all in black yeah, it was really powerful. Like the sound was so intense in the theater. So I went back on my own, alone. I went back to the East Village Theater to watch it. And I loved it. Interesting. Yeah, I loved it. I saw it again and like finally it made sense. It didn't feel like four hours, it felt like two hours. Yeah. And I had more energy and I was awake. And I got to see the song again. And anyway, so yeah, that was my experience. That was my experience. So I like far. how practical that review was. Like my first note, too late, Barbie. It was too late. Yeah. 86th Street, that's too high a number. I needed to be further south, lower number. Not even numbers, actually. It's like when Steve Martin was judging art by how it smells and how heavy it is. <laughs> yeah. Like painting. <laughs> um, I, my experience, well, I knew about the movie for a long time, but as just like a funny log line so like I you know I was familiar with the uh Greta Gerwig's earlier uh movies as a director and as an actor and uh and I had seen this is maybe like two years ago they just like some you know deadline.com headline Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach who's her partner romantic partner um but also a filmmaker are writing a Barbie movie for Mattel and it just seemed like such a like an absurdist line where I remember thinking just like sure I I like their work. That's interesting. I hope for their sake that it's not terrible. So they were writing it for Mattel, like Mattel had commissioned it or Mattel. Yeah, I think the Genesis. Throw their weight behind it once it was done. Like I think they were going to make it regardless. Mattel has like a fleet of films planned for like household objects. Uh, Barbie being like the most recognizable, but there's like an Uno movie in the works, which I don't even. That's neither here nor there. So I think the Genesis is that. Yes, Mattel and and whatever studio, I think Warner Brothers, it doesn't matter. Um, They had Margot Robbie set as like, she's a producer on it. So she was kind of like leading the charge. And then she advocated for getting Greta Gerwig to write it. And then Greta Gerwig did so with Noah Baumbach. And I kind of had that in the back of my mind as like, you kind of cross your fingers. Um, I mean, I think partially like on some level, it's a movie about a toy by a toy company. and um you know that you know there's a lot of ways to feel about that but that didn't even really occur to me when I read that because I like them I was like oh I hope it's good and I thought about that as like does that is this like a frog in boiling water thing like I've been inundated with so many dog-brained comic book movies for the past you don't know you're excited about like something yeah that I'm just like oh a Barbie movie well I like who's in it like that's a psychotic thing to say right like I we should kind of be like constitutionally offended by the notion of like we we're being marketed a movie about a toy and the marketing is like it's important like that's crazy anyway though but to well, my experience so I, yeah, yeah. marketing is our national love language now right yeah that yeah know. that's anyway. true in many ways I mean arguably it's more important than the, than the art itself but um uh so I saw it in the theater like you um reasonable hour I think it was <laughs> I wasn't too tired uh well, where was the theater located <laughs> it was in Miami Florida in Brickell uh specifically it was also one of the like it had the recliners and it was one where you order and they bring shit to you uh which I'm often kind of lukewarm on because 
it's one of those things, it's very American in that like the individualistic experience, you're like, oh, I can just order whatever I want whenever I want while I'm watching the movie. Isn't that great? It kind of moves up, it, it kind of like messes up the whole movie experience, right? Like, yeah, exactly. It fucks up the communal experience where I'm trying to watch whatever and suddenly like this guy is like getting his popcorn. Like it just and or 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 you know, anything can happen in an ordering situation, they get your order wrong, whatever, that's fine. But now instead of you just having to wait longer at a restaurant where you're comfortable, it's like now I'm thinking about where's my popcorn and I'm trying to watch minute 10 of the Northman and like a Viking is, is gutting a guy. Anyway, one thing to this theater's credit, you can only order during like a window at the beginning. So you don't have the thing where you get pulled out of the film by like, whatever. Okay. Uh, I'm doing what you did and I'm like reviewing the experience of going to a theater. Well, we need to get um, that out of our system so we can like distill down to the end. Uh, <laughs> right, so there I am reclined. Uh, anyway. Um, I knew, I, I saw it, I guess maybe a couple weeks after it had come out, but I, I was, I knew that it had become a phenomenon. I had avoided reading too much about it, just too much about like what actually happened in the movie, just to like preserve my experience or whatever. Um, I was, I think like you, not unpleasantly, but like bludgeoned by the first, by the beginning. It was loud, which is fine. It's a theater, but like so pink and so vibrant and the opening sequence is cut so almost like spastically like you saying it felt like a long TikTok reel I think is is deliberate but like had the effect of just like plastering me like I was suddenly in Barbie world and it was like day glow and the song would cut every 30 seconds and it was like this carousel of pop music and all these actors I recognize and um I also to the movie's credit it, it didn't feel and I, I don't think it is or was terribly computer generated. So it was like immersive in the sense that like, I could see like the tactile plastic of the fake water um, and everything in Barbie land to where like, yeah, it just, it did the job of, um, I don't know, almost like like a, a diuretic for my brain. Like it just cleared out everything else that I could have been thinking. And I was just suddenly completely in like Dago Barbie world. And um, I don't know, we could go through it, go through it in the whole, but on the whole, I really liked it. But again, but I've had the thought of kind of the frog in boiling water thing of like, am I seeing, am I isolating the memory of the things about it that I think are legitimately, I mean, one, like I laughed out loud, but also they're like legitimately thoughtful and clever and inventive. And am I kind of yada, yada, yada in my mind, the sort of things that are the trappings of a major motion picture paid for by a toy company, because I know that in order to get the budget to do the cool stuff in the film, you have to kind of pay the piper. It is like an intellectual property blockbuster movie. It's not a Marvel movie per se, but it kind of is playing in those waters. Yeah, I was trying to decide if it was a like how much of a comedy it was. Cause I was like, how much did I really laugh? Like I came away like thinking like, did I laugh like twice? Did I laugh a lot? Like, I don't remember. Like, um, <laughs> because I had so many emotions as the movie went through. And, you know, parts of it were, like, an, kind of annoying, like, that storyline of having to go to the real world and then, like, find the kid playing. And it was, like, an adult. I, just the whole thing was, like, so weird. It was, like, this almost, like, like they were trying to force, like, a Peter Pan thing on it, kind of. But mm. I don't know. They were just, I just, I was, like, can't we make the story, like, okay, so the opening, when they had all those little girls smashing those dolls because there's this new doll that's you know that's every woman and it shows all these jobs I thought that Barbie land was going to be like this place that's like run by women and we've never really seen what like that looks like we don't actually know what a true self-actualized like society of women looks like we know what like a squished weird annoying kind of like discussion petty national you know tear down version of it looks like because we don't know what that looks like so I was ready for like I was kind of like what is it going to look like and then yeah and then they put me in Barbie land and then forced me down the road of this like weird story that made no sense so I guess that part like was kind of it kind of just I don't know if it brought the whole thing down for me or it was like kind of confusing but I guess that's why I was like the parts that I laughed at like was I laugh like was they actually funny or like the only thing that really sticks out to me like that was truly like I, tr I truly felt seen and heard 
And the whole theater laughed too, I remember. And I was like, have we all had this thought? Because I know I've, I've had this, this thought. But when the guy is playing guitar at you forever. Yeah. And like waiting for some sort of like reaction, some sort of transcendence, like how people at an art show, they want to, they feel like they have to act transcendent. Some guy staring at you playing guitar, like he, like, you can't just look at him with neutral face. You, it's just, it's almost like, it is almost like a hostage situation. It's true. Yeah. If yeah. you don't know how to speak up for yourself and you think that this guy is the key to your, whatever. it's just really, yeah. And I'm just, I was like, that's the, that was, I think the big, like if they hadn't had that scene in there, like, I guess it just would have been the dance sequence for me and that would have been, but yeah, that, that, I, because they put that in there, I was like, they must get it. Like they must, they do get it. And so I guess like this movie might be, you know, I don't know, maybe it is great. I don't know. But like, what did you think about the story at one? Well, it was a little convoluted, but that's, I think that's okay. I, well, I, I wonder if. That's the yada yada part you're talking about, isn't it? Maybe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of like, yeah. But um, I wonder if it, the movie came together as, I think like the conceptualization of Barbie land is like pretty inspired. And I like the ending. And I think maybe in the, in putting it together, did the filmmakers maybe come up with like these broad concepts, this really immersive world, which is so incredibly detailed. Like I kind of want to see it again, just to catch more things about like the production design. And did the story, the America Ferrera character, the real world stuff, just kind of, did that come together third? I guess I wonder, like, was that there to kind of stitch together some of the set pieces that they wanted to put on film and some of the concepts that they wanted to actualize? Because like where, where actually the movie kind of not lost me, but where I felt its length was in that middle section where we're in the real world. There's a car chase for some reason. There's sort of like a Jacques Tati office situation where like Barbie is running in and out of doors. It gets very cartoonish. Like I was entertained, but once we left Barbie land, it felt a little bit like a spell was broken over me as an audience member. Um, even though I do think like the rendering of that sort of like hellish office complex in Los Angeles and like Ken's discovery of patriarchy, but it being this very childlike discovery where it's not that he necessarily longs to dominate over people, but it's actually liberating because he has been dominated for the, the entire, the eternity that he's existed. I guess we don't understand how mortality works in Barbie land, but so he's just discovering things like horses and like dismissing a woman, but he's like appreciating them the way like a ballet critic would, you know what I mean? Like he doesn't understand the meaning of things. He just sees and wants to emulate. I thought that well, worked really well, but then- are getting like, you know, respect. Yeah. Which he's never had, yeah. So yeah. I think it, it's also it was one very funny performance wise, two very clever because like there's a world in which we're watching a toy learn how to be sexist and it's horrifying. But the way between the writing and the way it's shot and Ryan Gosling's performance, it feels adorable and we understand. Like it, we we in for a moment are like sympathetic to the allure of patriarchy as a concept if you put yourself in a place where it's never you it, you're not familiar with it. it is completely foreign to you you have the exact opposite experience you are like a subjugated creature at the hands of women who don't care if you live or die or where you sleep at night for that matter um I thought that was great but then yeah you were like in a car chase suddenly there's like a boardroom it's a movie paid for by Mattel that acknowledges the existence of Mattel. So all the jokes at Mattel's expense being run by men or whatever, like they got laughs in the Mattel. room. Yeah. 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 But it's kind of like, you know, being self-deprecating is never, if you consent to a joke about yourself in a movie that you're paying for and profiting from, it must not be very biting of a joke or it wouldn't be in the Barbie movie. Do you know what I mean? It's not like anybody's tugging their collar on that one. Um, I was losing, my, I guess, my train of thought, but um, I agree with you that the best sequences were in Barbie land and not paradoxically, but like, I don't think it's a coincidence that as you're like drawing on your memory of what really resonated for you, they're all very Ken centric scenes. Um, I don't think that's a problem. I'm not saying that's you're bad, but I think that's a, not a problem for the movie, but like, I agree. Like that musical number is probably the most memorable thing. I thought the, the whole Matchbox 20 guitar thing was genius. The way it was filmed, the choice of that song, um, the observation, you know, you pointed out about like men playing guitar at people, but also I think preceding that or after that, do we get the sequence where the Barbies are indulging the Kens 
in their desire to explain shit, like The Godfather and Stephen Malcolmus. Um, those examples, I laughed, I think because one, they were funny, um, but they were also, they were also kind of like lovingly observed. Like that's a joke that you make from a place of like understanding and sympathy, if that makes sense. So in a sense, it's a joke at my expense. I'm a man in this theater watching this depiction of like how straight men talk, but I didn't feel, obviously I didn't feel attacked. That's psychotic. Um, but I, but I also felt like invited in by the joke because it was clearly written by someone who has like witnessed this and been on the other side of this and is kind of approaching it with like empathy at the same time as making fun of it. So that did work for me. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty complex movie, I guess. But maybe not because they put a lot of thought into it, but maybe because they made some short cuts. I don't know. No, I, I, I do think they put a lot of know. thought into it. What? I do think they put a lot of thought into it. I guess the- Well, sorry. I think they put a, a psychotically high amount of thought into it. What I mean is like, I guess in like certain areas of cohesion, like how you were saying, like, did were some of the decisions made to feature certain centerpieces or like get to the- yeah. Well, and I wonder, um, I guess sometimes, you know, the there's a cliche in like dressing yourself. I feel like I've heard this in like Project Runway or whatever, which is that and it's specifically directed at women. So maybe it's appropriately problematic for discussing the Barbie movie, but that like on your way out to go out or whatever, um, you've put on everything, all your accessories, whatever, look in the mirror and take one thing off, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a cliche, right? I think this movie maybe could do with that advice with respect to how many ideas and how many things it's trying to interrogate all at once, all these plates spinning while also pushing forward this plot of, you know, Barbie's hero's journey, basically, to um, eventually going to the gynecologist, which is a very funny last line. Um, but trying to do all those things and satiate all these things and be funny, but also, you know, this is a Mattel co-signed film it, it can't go it can't get too dark it has to appeal to the broadest amount of people as possible but also make each of them feel individually seen there's like a set piece where a woman gives you know a, a, a monologue about um what it's like to be a woman and so you have to play around that as well but it can't be alienating to men it has to poke fun at like masculinity without upsetting anyone like it's doing a lot and I wonder if in trying to execute on all of those things the end result gets a little bit muddled because there are a few okay, so there are two two moments that just pulled me out of the movie um and i i did not like and they both involve voiceover narration which arguably they could have taken out entirely even though i think it's helen mirren and you know god bless her um one of them is we're at weird barbie's mansion or whatever and barbie barbie <laughs> ma main barbie i don't know the margaret Rose typical character barbie there's typical barbie right is um going through her sort of existential crisis and she she's saying something about um how she's come to feel doubts about like the validity of her own appearance after going to the real world whatever and I think um America Ferrer's character says something like well if you feel that way like what do hope does any of us have but then there's like there's a close cut of Margot Robbie's face as she says this and she's expressing this dismay that she now has this kind of like dysmorphia of her own appearance and then the voiceover narration comes in and it says note to the filmmakers this point would be better if you didn't cast Margot Robbie yeah. and I, for a second I was like well, well wait you're the filmmaker like what you wrote that first of all second of all what are you commenting on you cast her because she looks like a personification of this idealized toy yeah. So like, what is even the meta commentary of, well, who should they have cast? A woman who looks more like a regular person? But if you did, then I wouldn't buy that she was Barbie because the whole point of your movie is this toy. Like that, I was just like, you guys, you guys like circled the square too hard there. That took me out. And then the second one, um, similar, was also voiceover narration way later in the film um, after the sort of like Ken insurrection has been quelled, which I thought was very funny as well. It, whatever, anyway, um, they're talking about how you know, the Kens could be better integrated into the Barbie land society. And one of them, I don't remember which one, is like, maybe we could get a Supreme Court justice. And then if I recall, President Barbie is like, eh, maybe like circuit court or appellate court or whatever, which like is kind of funny, but also it's like, wait, so Barbie land's like an apartheid state? It's not like the Kens, it's not like the Kens aren't ready to serve. It's not like Dr. Barbie actually knows how to practice medicine. The movie makes very clear that this is like fantasy land. So like any of those Kens could, staff a hospital in Barbie land because you just go like 
bada bing, bada boom, and the, the thing heals. That's fine. It's just a little joke. But then the voiceover narration comes in and goes, so maybe one day they could have as much power in the legal system as women have in the real world. And that again pulled me out of the movie because it's like, well, one, I don't know. I it, it, I don't necessarily like just having this omniscient narrator to like lean in and be like, hey, man, you notice it's pretty bad out there, right? Like, yeah, I know. I get it. But but secondly, it feels like it kind of puts a cap on technically Barbie land can be anything that its denizens make it. And maybe now I'm I'm committing the sin of the movie and, and getting to into this. But if what we're saying is that even in this fantasy land, the realities of gender are such that the Kens can only aspire to the non-equality that women have in this world what why i mean like technically barbie land could be completely equitable society they could achieve full-fledged luxury communism right it's fucking toy world there's nothing <laughs> stopping them they don't have to go to work like, yeah so it yeah. just seemed really odd to like put that constraint on it and it feels like like i said some of the if some of the movie feels reverse engineered like they wanted to make that commentary Mm -hmm. bring you back to the real world make that point have the narrator do it fair enough but it's grafted onto all these other ideas that they've done that I thought were successful that I was totally riding with and then this voice from the heavens comes in and just pulls me right back out of the movie and back into my chair thinking like oh yeah I don't know that's kind of a convoluted point but do you know what no, I mean just no like, I yeah. know what you mean um and I wonder if that's what kind of made it mainstream was that it was just really this sort of cartoonish role reversal this mm -hmm. like just to sort of satire the way that things are now but that, but that worked for me when it was working like I said like Ryan Gosling discovering patriarchy and thinking that it's mostly about horses yeah but, but it, did, it, it, it didn't like explode into the next level it, yeah no, like no, none of it brought it to a next level it sort of just yeah that where we're at like is that what you mean like they didn't kind of they, they I guess didn't, what like, I mean they didn't invent that... a new world they just sort of well, or that they did there. but then pulled me out of it by leaning in to be like, doesn't this make you think about this world? And I was like, yes, I was already there. You were doing such a great job <laughs> with the implication. Yeah. You didn't have to like, hey buddy, pretty sexist out there, huh? It's like, no, fuck it, I know, man. Um, but I guess, well, I guess my problem is is that, yeah, some of the, some of the more heavy handed things seem to undercut what I thought was so successful. And I think why it was jarring to me is not because it was bad per se, but because what it was pulling me away from was so good. I was so into that whole sequence, the return to Barbie land where the Kens have turned it into this like idiotic sixth grade sleepover. And like, it was so funny. That's where the sequences with the guitar playing come from. And the, you know, the, uh, well, and actually, and there's like, uh, I appreciate this about the movie, the joke, um, one, Issa Rae's character pronounces Godfather, Godfather, which is hilarious. Like she walks up and says, oh, are you watching The Godfather? I've never seen it. Yeah. That's very funny. <laughs> Two, the, the Ken then go, launches into this like uh, explanation of like, well, when you think about it, Francis Ford Coppola and the director of The Godfather and Robert Evans, the producer, really perfected making art in the studio system because it was this blockbuster film that had these artistic aspirations. And that's such like a shut the fuck up kind of comment. But at the same time, you can imagine that that is something that Greta Gerwig and that's a conversation that she has had and, and Noah Baumbach as well, in that in a way that is what they are aspiring to do. They've made a movie about a toy, just as um, Francis Ford Coppola was adapting in The Godfather. I, I'm doing now the thing from the movie. <laughs> the book was like a, it was like a page turner. It was not considered like high literature, right? But then they, they turned to something else. I think that they, that's almost a meta commentary on their own work because they are trying to make something I don't know if they, they I don't, I'm sure they wouldn't compare it to The Godfather, that would sound really highfalutin, but like they're trying to make something lasting out of arguably kind of tawdry source material, which is like a plastic lady that makes people mad. So uh, yeah, anyway. Plastic lady that makes people mad. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did you know the, the, the real Barbara's still alive? That no. the Barbie was based on? The daughter of, of the, no, I didn't know. The that. daughter of Ruth Handler, Barbara. Mm -hmm. What did you think of that? Of what? The ghost. Which is that whole, that plot element, there being the ghost of the inventor and I her being kind that, of the... Well, I was reading about that and actually I didn't, I didn't realize that's what that was really, but like the woman on the bench, right, being Ruth, like I was reading that that's not, that wasn't supposed to be her and that like... Oh, wait, wait, no, I'm sorry. I mean, 
because there's a character like Rhea Perlman's character is the ghost of Ruth Handler who is in the office oh sorry yeah at the end yeah, yeah. Right, right right um yeah yeah and she was like escaping everyone and she like found her in that like kind of back room and she like and then she in the end ends the up being end. this kind of like godlike character who who imbues her with yeah, tactile I femininity like, I don't know I, I guess yeah like kind of like Geppetto like making <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. a real boy or something yeah like and all of a sudden she like was going to a gynecologist she like yeah that was pretty weird um yeah I don't know it's like she it was almost like you know when someone dies and the power they held kind of gets released to the people almost like it's not interesting like like when they killed Franco in Spain you mean like like a toppling of a dictator not necessarily like say like I don't know like maybe either like someone at the head of your family dies and you have to take on responsibility okay. Okay. or like you're freed up to I don't know like embody the lessons they taught you and like I don't know like something happens or or like a, or it could be a big figure or something but like taking the power out of the Barbie and like like just releasing it even more onto the people like I really love how the this corporation like ended it with her going to a gynecologist it was such a nice little exclamation point for like yeah. I don't know these like sort of you know feminist initiatives we're all trying to do which I know some people don't like the word feminist because um uh... <laughs> yeah I don't know why yeah whatever some people don't like it I don't yeah yeah whatever <laughs> They have their reasons. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I the end really worked on me because it's it's set up. Uh, obviously, you, you feel like she's going to a job interview, and so yeah, w- which I hadn't picked apart that that would have been kind of a bleak ending. That it's like, oh, you're a real yeah, woman now. She has to, to work. To, like you have to work, but it's it's a it's a more poignant ending. It's like you're a real woman now. You have to like you know your body, the maintenance of your body, which is very much what the movie is is kind of getting at. And there's it's no coincidence. Like what this the other. Well, this movie's been in development longer than the Supreme Court has overturned the right to get an abortion at a federal level. But like, it feels like it exists in not dialogue with that, but like, and I don't want to say that hangs over it either, because that would be such a bummer for a movie that's mostly very fun, but it feels aware of that. And so I think that ending is, you know, all the more poignant because of it and because it's done so cheerfully. She's delighted to go to the gynecologist and then the credits roll. That's nice. Is it wrong for us to talk about the ending, or like, has that, should everyone have basically seen it by now? Um, it's like your fault if you haven't seen it. That's not my problem. No, yeah. Well, one, <laughs> yeah, probably. And two, though, it's not like. Well, I guess we spoil it in that we spoil it. The reveal, the word gynecologist is like the last word of the film, but um, it's not like a spoiler, like the sixth sense kind of spoiler. Like, like once you know how Barbie ends, like, oh well, fuck, now I might as well not even see it. Gynecologist, guess I'll just <laughs> up and I'm already dead. Like. Have you seen Oppenheimer? I have not. I haven't. Either. I do want to. Um, I just. Haven't I heard it was boring. Time. Someone said it was boring. I don't love Christopher Nolan. In fact, some of his movies I really dislike. Um, I was excited but... to see Richard Feynman in it, though. I saw that. Like, does he play the bongos? He better. You, I mean, you got Feynman in the movie. He better hit that bongo. Or I'm walking right out. <laughs> <laughs> um no, that'll be a good opening yeah opening sequence oh. yeah Feynman on the bongo um I it's kind of like a Barbie opening like you know like Feynman the bongos and there's like a whole dance party with all the scientists it's, yeah but... Los Alamos but it's just mm-hmm. like a, a bungalow yeah that would be sick um just like real Los Alamos um I what was I gonna say damn uh Feynman Barbie no I don't know well I I think um uh to your point about the Ken song which I also I thought that whole sequence was delightful I mean they're doing like Busby Berkeley shit every I like a big production I realize I'm not a musical theater person but if you sneak some musical theater shit into a non-musical movie I you know I'm like let's go um but I think again just how like lovingly observed Ken is even when he is the butt of the joke the big triumphant call and response portion of the song where he says so like he begins by lamenting I'm just Ken and, and then over the course uh, of three enough. minutes <laughs> well yeah over the course of three minutes I'm just Ken becomes this affirmation I am just Ken and and 
and I'm enough. So he like, takes his like, power back. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but he like he owns his mediocrity, which is kind of a beautiful statement. He doesn't realize, oh, I, I was a genius all along. No, he's dumb as hell. He's a toy. But he's that's okay. Stuff. But that's okay. And and so and so the call and response of the other Ken saying, I'm just Ken and I'm enough. And then you know, the chord changes. He says, and I'm great at doing stuff is like I, we were talking about this earlier I found that like oddly moving Even me too just, like, I felt I, it like it was kind of like yeah it was like a little bit of like a little tingly like body sensation I was like wow yeah. why I don't know but it worked yeah well just claiming and even just claiming your own mediocrity I'm someone who just moved apartments and so every well you can't see but every picture hung on this wall I fucking I hung that all right I'm I'm great at doing stuff like I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I am relatively tall and I could use a screwdriver. And there is something to be said for rejoicing in just the quotidian dumb shit that um, is ascribed to men. And I think that's, it's Ken claiming that. Also the, I think he wears at one point sweatpants with the word Ken in the sort of Metallica logo, with like the lightning bolts. Sick, As, uh, that, that moment got me too. I was like, damn, those are, those are good. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I get sounds like we give it like a 10 out of 10. No, just kidding. Um, what do you have a I don't even know. That? I'm glad it exists. I'm glad it exists. Like, I stopped going, I, I want to see it again. Yeah. yeah, me too. The like Marvel movies, which I know I was just shitting on because I hate them and they're bad, but like, there was a time in which you know, one would come out and I would see it like an Avengers movie because it's like to participate in the culture. Like, well, I'd like to have my own opinion, I probably won't like it. I didn't like it, but it's complicated for this, this, this. I just tuned out because they make a new one every three months and like movie stars are doing steroids to be like Blippo the Blappo in Avengers 9. And like, I just don't care. It's happening in multiple universes now. So it's like, well, that guy's dead, but he's actually not dead. And then in this one, he's played by a salamander, but in this one, it's a woman. And it's like, I don't fucking care. Um, <laughs> so I've tapped out. So I'm not like plugged into whatever, but I find those movies so vacuous. If the future of our like big budget celebrity entertainment where everything is tied to a comic book character or a toy or like whatever if it could all be more like barbie the world would be a wonderful place i'm afraid it won't be but like in that context this is probably the best and most creative and like thoughtful and like auteurist version of this kind of movie which is like the main kind of movie that america makes now that i've ever seen 